Adventure Action RPG. Hello and welcome to the first episode of my new show about action RPGs. My name is Digibro and while I've been playing action RPGs for quite some time, only recently did I become completely enamored with them and decide to go on an adventure to find all of the best ones and then talk about them. Now some of you may be thinking, hey, doesn't this show look a lot like zero punctuation with the colors inverted? Well, that's pretty much where I got the idea for the visuals. However, this show is going to be nothing like that one. For one thing, this show will feature a friendly, relaxed tone. I will only be talking about action RPGs. My reviews will be long and in-depth. My visual style is vaguely unsettling, and the font that I use is Blue Highway. Also, importantly, I will be using actual game footage in my reviews, mostly because I lack the talent or patience to do what Yahtzee does. So what is an RPG? I think the most generally agreed upon definition is that an RPG is a game which features stat-driven progression. This means that your characters will level up or their stats will increase in some way throughout the game. RPGs can be broken up into the categories turn-based RPGs and action RPGs. In turn-based RPGs, characters take their turns attacking using commands selected from a menu. Action RPGs, in the meantime, are a bit hard to define. One of the best action RPGs of all time is Soul Blazer for the Super Nintendo. Now in this game, basically you run around and you swing your sword at enemies and that's about it. You just hit the same button to swing the sword. You can fire little magic spells, though I hardly ever used those. Your character makes progress throughout the game by leveling up and collecting items which raise your amount of health and attack and defense. Another game series that can be described almost the exact same way is the Legend of Zelda series. Yet, because of the fact that Zelda doesn't have a clear leveling up system, it is not as often considered an action RPG. However, in The Legend of Zelda, you still pick up items which increase your health, defense, and attack, and you still spend the entire game pretty much just swinging your sword at enemies. Now here's another game which I could describe this way. God of War. In God of War, essentially, you run up to enemies, you hit them with your swords. You collect items which increase your health, attack, etc. In other words, it might as well be considered an action RPG. Yet, you probably won't see anyone call it that. The fact of the matter is that trying to compare a bunch of games which are similar but not alike is fucking difficult. It's not always easy to create a definitive set of rules that defines a genre. What really makes a game an action RPG is purely gut feeling. It's that RPG atmosphere which can't really be defined, yet is something easily understood. It's not just in how the story is told or how the game is played or how the world is designed, it's in the way these elements work together to create a certain atmosphere. It's hard for me to even describe why I like this genre so much, that I want to play as many of its games as possible and make lengthy video reviews for them. I'm a fan of many different types of games, from fighters like Skullgirls or Guilty Gear, to action games like Resident Evil 4 and Devil May Cry, to platformers like Super Meat Boy and Mega Man X, and even turn-based RPGs like my lifelong addiction, the Pokemon series. It's just that there's something about action RPGs that makes me love them... inherently. Anyways, that's the long and short of it. Only time will tell exactly what games I decide are action RPG enough for my show. Since I've already spent so much time on the introduction, I decided that for this video I'd review a very simple action RPG game which I can go over in a couple hundred words. So without further ado, this is my review of Dungeon Explorers 1 and 2 for the Turbo Graphics. Now I'm sure that right off the bat some of you are wondering, what the fuck is a Turbo Graphics? In Japan this console was known as the PC Engine, and it's noteworthy for still to this day being the smallest video game console ever made. As you can see from the slot on the front of the machine, it used very tiny cartridges which were more like cards. For some reason when they brought the console to America they called it the Turbo Graphics and they made it much larger. I can only imagine this is because of the general rule that everything's bigger in the USA. The PC Engine slash Turbo Graphics was developed by Hudson Soft, whom you probably have heard of from their work on games such as Bomberman, Bloody Roar, and Goddamn Mario Party. A few years after the release of the PC Engine, Hudson released a CD-ROM attachment. This is basically like a second console that you attach to the first one, which runs CDs. This is noteworthy especially for being the very first video game console that ever had games on discs. This console was released in the United States as the TurboGrafx-CD, also known as the Turbo Duo. 
Now unfortunately, the Turbo Duo was ludicrously expensive, and because of this, it didn't sell particularly well and not a lot of developers wanted to make games for it, so it didn't have a huge selection. One of the well-remembered franchises from the Turbo Graphics was Dungeon Explorer, which was published by Hudson Soft themselves, and the second game was actually developed by them, whereas the first one was developed by Atlas. Dungeon Explorer 1 was released for the Turbo Graphics in 1989, and four years later, Dungeon Explorer 2 came out for the Turbo CD, or Turbo Duo. The damn thing has a lot of names. A couple of years later, Hudson also made a spin-off game of Dungeon Explorer for the Super Nintendo called Crystal Beans, and oddly enough, in 2007, they made a Dungeon Explorer game for the Nintendo DS and PSP. I will not be talking about either of these games in this review, however. I decided to play Dungeon Explorer 2 first because I was curious about what the graphics would be like on the first console that ever used discs. I wouldn't say that the game appears graphically inferior to the Super Nintendo, however it's not very visually interesting. The color scheme skews dark and the visual style is very bland. Compared to other games which came out in 1993, Dungeon Explorer 2 is nothing special. One of the reviews on Game FAQs calls it one of the most beautiful games for the TurboGrafx CD. And that doesn't sound particularly promising. If you've ever played any of the Gauntlet games, then you pretty much know what to expect from Dungeon Explorer 2. If you haven't, this is basically a game wherein you walk around and you shoot arrows out of your crotch and kill enemies. All of the enemies are generated out of spawners which are strewn about the level. These spawners will keep creating enemies indefinitely until you destroy the spawner. Your objective in each room is primarily to destroy the spawners as fast as possible before they can spawn too many enemies and overwhelm you. Although one of the interesting things about Dungeon Explorer is that there's no real incentive to kill all the enemies, and in fact if you can progress without doing so, you can get through a dungeon much quicker. Okay, it's not entirely true that there's no incentive to kill enemies. A lot of them drop power-ups. However, if you die, you lose all your power-ups, and personally I died a whole lot. But it was in dying all these times that I realized I wasn't quite playing Dungeon Explorer the correct way. Both of the Dungeon Explorer games are really meant to be multiplayer experiences. Each of them can support up to five simultaneous players, which honestly is kind of a dick move because the Turbo Graphics only has one controller port on it and you have to buy an extension that can add up to five controller ports. If you've got a few friends who are really into games like Gauntlet or just love playing old games, then this game might be worth your time. It can be bought on the Wii Virtual Console now, so it's not terribly hard to come by. Unfortunately, only the first Dungeon Explorer game is available on Wii Virtual Console in the United States, whereas the second one is available in Japan. After watching people play this game multiplayer on YouTube, I saw the fun that could be had. As a multiplayer experience, this game would be pretty much a breeze. The dungeons are very short, and in fact the entire game is very short and could probably be breezed through in about an hour. However, if you're playing alone, the dynamic of the game changes a lot. Out of the four hours or so that I spent playing Dungeon Explorer 2, I spent a lot of that time lost. I just flat out had no idea what the hell I was doing. The game does not do a whole lot to convey exactly what you're supposed to do. Usually someone will tell you to go west, and that's about it. But there are a lot of different areas to be explored, and some of these lead to dungeons which are optional but are not very clear on what you're doing there. For instance, early in the game, I went into a dungeon, and I ran through it, and it had a shitload of teleportals all over the place. I didn't go through all of them, I just went through a bunch of random ones, and eventually I met this guy, and he's like, I'm gonna join your team. And then after I do this, I went back to that place, and I went through teleportals and stuff, and eventually just ended up back at the entrance, and I realized that that was it. That was the entire purpose of that dungeon. No one sent me there, there's no indication that I was done, it's just that basically each dungeon, if you if you found something and it, and, it, uh, and, it, and it sent you back to the start of the dungeon, you're done. That's it. That's, uh, that's what I inferred from, from playing through there. There are a lot of NPCs in this game, and none of them have anything interesting to say. In fact, most of them will just tell you the same thing as everyone else in their town, which is just, there's a bad guy and we need you to kill it and that'll let you go forward into the next town. One of my favorite things about this game, by the way, is that there are no inns, but when you want to heal, you go to the bar. 
That sounds about right for me. Another interesting thing is that at the beginning of the game, you choose what class you're going to play. However, throughout the game, you will meet characters in each of the other classes, and you're allowed to switch between them by going to the bar and talking to one of the women there who will ask you if you'd like to change your character. This was very interesting because it allowed for different play styles, even though most of the characters are very similar. Basically, the only difference is that one might be slightly faster or slightly stronger or have slightly more HP. And as a matter of fact, because of this, some of the characters just are useless, whereas other ones are amazing because their stats just, you know, they just work better. I could not figure out what any of the power-ups or items were when I was first playing the game. I figured if I had a manual on me, it would probably help, but then I had to go onto game FAQs and look it up. So it turned out I didn't I had thought that they were items, and it bothered me that I couldn't figure out how to use them. But it turns out that they're actually power-ups which will temporarily raise your stats. Though again, if you die, you lose your power-up. Like in Gauntlet, you have a certain amount of times that you can die before you get a game over. After you die, you hit a button and you respawn right where you died. Unfortunately, the enemies have a tendency to still be standing around the spot where you died. So if you respawn, it's very likely that you could just take a shitload of damage or even just die immediately, which happened to me a number of times. After you've died four or five times, it doesn't actually tell you, then you will uh, get a game over. Now in Dungeon Explorer 2, when you get a game over, it sends you back to the beginning of the area that you're currently playing in. However, things are very different in Dungeon Explorer 1, and now I'll be getting into that game. Even though the two games play almost exactly alike, with the same kinds of dungeon layouts, same kinds of traps, same kinds of enemies, and same way that you attack, there are a few subtle changes which make all the difference. The biggest one is the difference in continues. In the second game, if you lose all your lives, you continue from the beginning of the area, but in the first game, you have to use a password system. Therefore, if you get a game over, you will have to reset your game, enter the password, and start back in the central town. Now, the second game also has a bigger world than the first game. The second game has a number of towns which connect the areas, whereas the first game only has one central town which sends you to all the different areas. So having to go back to the central town isn't as bad as it would have been in the second game. However, you still lose some of your progress because of the fact that in the first game when you type in your password all it remembers is how many bosses you've killed. So basically you have a different password each time you kill a boss and that password will remember uh, how far you've been. Ultimately this isn't so bad. I just didn't like having to type that password in every time because it was 10 letters long and I had to scroll through all the letters and it was just kind of a pain in the ass compared to the second game you know having easy save points. Now I'm generally not a fan of short dungeons in games, or levels at all, because if it's very short, then it's not very memorable. The dungeons in Dungeon Explorer can be blasted through so fast that the first few dungeons I played I thought, oh, this must just be because it's an early dungeon, you know, they're, they, I guess they get longer, but they don't really. So despite the name Dungeon Explorer, the dungeons aren't exciting. All of the early dungeons in both games kind of look like Mount Moon from Pokemon, but there is a bit more visual interest as you progress. My favorite was in Dungeon Explorer 2 when I got into a vampire mansion, which was pretty cool. One of the other subtle differences between the games is that in Dungeon Explorer 2, you talk to people by running into them, and this brings up their dialogue box. This could get a little annoying when I accidentally ran into some people several times, but no big deal. In the first game, you can't actually talk to people, and you like when you walk into their house, then they'll say their dialogue, but you can't actually press a button to talk to them. It's just a random thing that I noticed that I thought was interesting. All in all, neither of these games is particularly difficult because of the fact that the dungeons are so short. So even if you did die five times by the boss and get a game over on the boss, it takes so little time to rush back that it's not particularly frustrating, and this is what kept me able to play for a considerable amount of time. However, I just wasn't that interested in the game that I wanted to keep going and play it all the way through, especially after I figured out how much more fun it would be if I was able to play multiplayer. Another thing worth mentioning is that I love the cheesy cutscenes that play in Dungeon Explorer 2 before each boss fight. Just watch a couple of these. So, did you like it? I played it in your honor. I think it sets the mood nicely for your death. Are you ready? 
My hammer will make you so tender. <laughs> you wouldn't think of crossing these woods without stopping to play with me, would you? I also really enjoyed the opening song in the first game. And the first game in general seems to have better music, although the second one has some pretty kick-ass dungeon exploring tunes. All in all, I would not recommend Dungeon Explorer as a single player experience unless you've really run out of action RPGs or you're just like a huge fan of old school Gauntlet and want to play other games that are similar. But again, as a multiplayer experience, I do think that it might be worth checking out if you like that kind of game. Both Dungeon Explorer games certainly get very good reviews and seem to be well liked, especially by people who played them back in the day. So I think that they're worth being aware of at the very least. Now as you can see on screen I have a rating scale that I will be using for these reviews. Basically it's a scale of I loved it to I hated it with I was okay with it in the middle. I was kind of okay with Dungeon Explorer but ultimately I didn't really care for it especially as a single player experience. Anyway that's all I have to say about these two Dungeon Explorer games and I'll see you next time. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and maybe the subscribe button, although I warned you that my channel has all kinds of shit on it. Anyway, see ya.